Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Roger Derling. I'm the executive director of the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, and I am so excited to have with me Ryan White, uh, the director of Assassins, and the producer, Jessica Hargrave. Um, I actually want to start with a quote from uh, Variety that said, as you watch the movie, I promise that there are moments where your jaw will drop. And th that's actually a great assessment of the film. As I was watching this, there were moments that I just couldn't believe what was actually happening. And which leads me to my, my first question, um, that I, I, I was made aware that you guys, as I was watching the film, that you guys had not met the two subjects, City and Duan, um, before you started filming and what was it like for you, the two of you to be spending all this time documenting a subject that you guys had not come into close contact beforehand? Yeah, it was a pretty uh, different way of documentary filmmaking. So traditionally, you know, access is everything in documentaries and traditionally in the films we've made, you know, getting contact with the people that our story is about is paramount. But in this case, Siti and Duan, by the time we started our film, were in jail. They were on death row in solitary confinement. Um, you're not allowed to enter jails in Malaysia, even as press. So we had no access to them. So every day we were at the courthouse as they were, you know, marched in. You see those images in the film of them in bulletproof vests surrounded by dozens of soldiers with AK-47s um, and very quickly ushered into the courtroom and then ushered out at the end of the day. And that was our access to them. So it became this very strange way to make a film where your main characters are a total mystery to you. So by the end, I mean, I guess everyone watching here has already watched the film, so I can spoil it. Um, you know, getting getting to meet them for us somewhat meta and ironically was like meeting celebrities because we they had been mystery women to us for two years, our obsession for two years, because the central question, the central thrust of the film was, who are these women and what led to this moment? And so to finally meet both of them, which was in you know separate times, se separate circumstances, like I have chills talking about it now because it was probably two of the most special moments of my filmmaking career. Mm -hmm. And we never expected it to happen. Everybody was expecting these women to be executed. So it was a total mm -hmm. happy surprise that we even ever got to meet them and include them in the documentary. Um, Jessica, um, Ryan says that there was a mystery about this ladies. Um, what was it about them that, that made you latch on to the idea of documenting them and the story? I think as Ryan said, I mean, it was such a mystery to us. And even though we didn't have access to them, we always knew we wanted them to be the focus of the film, which was again, difficult because without access, how do you make them the focus? But really we were just so curious, you know, like, a, like documentary filmmakers, but also skeptical, I'll be honest, you know, when we first read about this story and we read uh, the headline, you know, we saw two female, female assassins. We thought that that was noteworthy, but we read that they were hired and they had gotten caught and that was sort of the end of it. And then when we got a phone call from a journalist whose name is Doug Clark and he was looking into the story and he said, there's more to it. I think that you guys, maybe we could jump on the phone. And we said, of course, and we did. And listening to him describe what really turned out to be fact-based evidence that supported this assertion that they had made that seemed so unbelievable at first. And that was just what was so striking to us about it is you, you read that, you hear that, you think, no way, that's not possible. And then you look at all of the evidence that we were um, seeing and, and um, finding and discovering with the attorneys and others as we made the film, you start to look at all of that and you start to see that it's supporting what they claim. And then you realize it's not that unbelievable. And then it actually is somewhat relatable, which I think was really an interesting arc for us is at first it seemed so distant and absurd and not true. We both thought there's no way about that. But then as we learned more about it, we thought this is actually, you can watch in these text messages, you can watch the manipulation that was happening via social media, which in fact happens all the time, just not normally to such an extreme degree. 
Mm -hmm. But even before, um, to both of you, even before the, the trial started, there was so much misinformation about them. Like I remember reading about that there was lipstick. Yeah. There was all these like crazy theories about what had happened. Um, were you guys aware of all that? And, and was that part of the allure that brought you in to, to dissipate the get to the truth? I think I'll let Ryan speak about it, but I think that specific example is exactly right because it was one of those headlines that like scratch an itch, like people would say, oh, if you brought it up, they would say, oh yeah, I remember something about that. And then they would say, wasn't it? And one person was like, they like blew a powder on his face or they put lipstick on or there was perfume. There was always something that people remembered inaccurately normally, but it was just because it was so bizarre. They had that like slight hint of familiarity and so that's what made this documentary so perfect to dive into because it's like, you guys know a little bit about this, but you don't know what really happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, 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 uh, that original portrayal of them as these sort of like black widow, bond women, femme fatales, one wearing an LOL sweatshirt was chilling. It was like, oh, these, this is like the most high level assassins that could exist in the world. So unraveling who they actually were was quite uh, fun in that type of way because it, it, it dismantled everything that we thought about them as well. But to your point, because we've been talking about this film with friends and family for a couple of years, but keeping it secret and everybody has that same reaction, some sort of misinformation, but a glimmer of recognition of, of the, remembering the headline. So it gave us a very rare opportunity as documentary filmmakers to tell you know, I, I hate to relegate this to true crime, but it is a crime story. And to tell a crime story on the most massive level, like on the most massive geopolitical level, where we felt like most of our audience wasn't going to know anything about it. They weren't mm -hmm. going to know what the backstory was of the two women. And they definitely, unless they are, you know, North Korea files, are definitely not going to know what ended, ha ended up happening in the trial. So that was really fun in the editing room to, to be able to edit with a way where we were building in the suspense, which we lived in real time. We had no idea. We were discovering this as we went and we didn't know what was gonna happen in the trial. So the goal in the edit room was edit it exactly how we experienced it and hope people don't Google it before they go in and like send them on the same journey we did. Um, but, but did you go in assuming that they were they were not assassins because at least um, my entry into the story is that I'm 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 feeling that that they're not assassins. I mean, where were you vis-a-vis -vis their culpability or lack of culpability? I mean, I would say at the beginning, at the beginning we were skeptical about the story, so we we were thinking that they were guilty. Um, or, I mean, and that's what's so interesting oh, wow. about this is that it's like, it's not a question of if, it's a question of why, like they're on camera committing this murder. So it was a really, it's sort of flipping a true crime as Ryan referenced on its head, cause it's not a whodunit, like we know who did it or we know who physically did it, but why did they do it? So we went in thinking like, again, just not believing that, that that could really be a plausible explanation. But quickly, I mean, I think, you know, after we talked to the journalist, Doug Clark, Ryan was on a plane a couple of weeks later. And I think literally on that first trip after meeting with a few people, it like slowly unraveled and made us realize um, that, that there was more to the story than we realized at first. So he did when when you first met with him, he had an he had an idea that that they had been duped. Yes, Doug did. Doug. So Doug um, is an investigative journalist. He lived in Indonesia for years. He speaks Bahasa Indonesia, and so he had really um, started investigating this story. It just sort of it's North Korea is somewhat his beat, but it had like piqued his interest too. There just must be more there. So he was already saying, "You guys should take a look at this because I think that there's more to the story." So he was already starting to find sources. I mean, he didn't have access to like the documents and the CCTV and the text messages and all of that stuff yet. It was really just people telling him stories like about who these women were. He was really focused on Siti, the Indonesian woman because of the language that he spoke, but he was finding out about, you know, it's this village girl and her family maintains her innocence. But then you start to find, he found the cab driver who tells the story about introducing her to the North Korean and 
without a lot of motivation to be making something like that up, it just started to sort of fall together. Well, through mm. a lot of work and then with, and Doug went back with Ryan too, as well to Indonesia on that, uh, sorry, to Malaysia on that first trip to continue that investigation together. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what was it like knowing that, that, that their fate could be death? Um, <laughs> You guys were were spending two years in this trial and so invested in them and knowing that they could end up dead. Yeah, and that was that was what everyone was telling us was going to happen. So the longer we made the film, the more our eyes were open to the fact that they might be innocent. But the longer we were making the film, also the more certain it looked like they were going to be executed. As the trial kept unfolding, it was clear the odds were stacked against them. The Malaysian case was totally one-sided. And when the, you know, it's the British system of law there, when the judge made his ruling after the prosecution went, and it's not a jury system, you know, the judge would have ultimately decided their fate. When he wrote that ruling, we knew that their, that their fate was sealed, that they were gonna be executed. He said emphatically in his ruling, I don't believe that they thought this was a prank. And so all signs mm. were pointing towards the execution. And then we started having conversations like, can we even make a film? Like, how do you make a film proving someone's innocence and then the ending is watching them die? Like, how do you even put that out into the world? Uh, would mm. anybody want to watch it? And is it even ethical? So then we pivoted to the idea that we would, we were editing like crazy while we were shooting, that we would have a film ready to go by the ending and just need to plug in the conviction at the end and we would release the film, like even without film festivals, if we had to, right after they were convicted in hopes that during the small appeals process that it could create some sort of international outcry or outrage. Um, and so that was kind of the world we were living in for a couple of years was thinking that's what was gonna happen. And their lawyers were aware of that. I was telling them that was our plan if their clients were convicted. So the way it up, the way it ended up unfolding, I mean, that day in the courtroom where Sitsi was released is definitely the most shocking day of my filmmaking career. No, even the judge was shocked. Everybody was shocked. It was so kept quiet that that might happen and nobody saw it coming. So it's strange. I wouldn't argue that our film has a happy ending, um, but it definitely doesn't have the dark, dark ending that we were predicting. Wow. It's one of the moments that our jaws drops too, you know, with the quote that you led with, like making this film, it was, there were many times where we just were, our mouths were agape at what was happening. Um, I, you, you made a really interesting directorial choice, which is that you use the two journalists as our, our guides into the story. Can you, can you tell, T you know, tell our, our viewers about why you made that choice of the, the two, and they're, and they're very compelling guys. You want me to go? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry, I had directorial you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm never in my documentaries. I never have been, so I've never acted as a guide. So we're often looking for that in, in our documentaries. Like, who's the person that knows this world better than we do? who can be a somewhat um, objective narrator to take us through. So from the very beginning, we were looking for a local journalist that would understand uh, the culture in that world that we were inside of better than we do. And that's where we found Hadi. He's the Malaysian journalist that's there throughout the film. Um, and it's not the first time we've done this either. I mean, Doug was the genesis of this article. Um, and then Hadi became the person we were following. So we often work side by side with investigative journalists when, when making a documentary. We did it on a Netflix series called The Keepers. The Keepers, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and journalists in that way, I mean, a journalist, journalist job is exciting, much more exciting than a lawyer. And we filmed many lawyers in this film and in the past, and that's much harder to capture drama. Like these investigative journalists bring the drama. Anna Fifield, uh, she, you know, she literally wrote the book on Kim Jong-un. She's probably the leading world expert on uh, Kim Jong-un and maybe the Kim regime. And so we didn't interview her until the end. Um, she and I actually happened to be in Hong Kong at the same time for, for separate projects. And, and we, we caught her there and we interviewed her at the very end. But the more we edited the film, 
the more we realized that the geopolitical web that these women had gotten ensnared in had to be had to be detailed to the audience. You know, we were so concentrated on the micro, and by micro I mean the two women and the trial and their lives, that we weren't very, we weren't as interested in the big picture um, at the beginning. Uh, but mm -hmm. then it became clear as we watched the film, like if you can't understand how these women ended up in this situation, or especially how the ending is going to go because we never expected it to become such a, a geopolitical ending with all of these foreign governments ultimately deciding the fate of these women. Um, so that's when we went to Anna. And, uh, you know, I think I'm so glad we did because she's an, a, an incredible storyteller, but the detail and depth with which she's able to uh, not only research, but to relay the history of the Kim regime. I and mean, we, we always called it our Game of Thrones part that we didn't know anything <laughs> about. You know, it was like a soap opera, like the, the rival mothers and the trickery and, um, you know, the exiles. So it added a whole, whole mention, a whole different dimension in a much more macro level, I think, to the film by adding them. Mm -hmm. The other compelling aspect is that the the backgrounds of these two young ladies, they're completely culturally, you know, their education is different um, and et cetera. Um, you know, can you talk talk about that, Jessica, the fact um, that th using that, the contrast of the two different backgrounds of the CT and, and Duan? Yeah, I think that it's really, for us, it was really just heartbreaking to us to think about what happened to these women who both for various reasons were looking for a better life and thought that they had found a way to get it. And these, uh, the operatives preyed upon their vulnerabilities, each of them having different ones, Juan wanting to be famous, seeking fame and them offering it to her. City less focused on fame, but wanting a better life, wanting to be able to send money back to her family, not wanting to work in the sweatshop. So they found these two women after searching and you know working with other women, trying to get other women ensnared in this. And then they found these two women who were willing and open to, to participating because they thought it was an opportunity, because they thought it would give them a better life. And yes, they had different backgrounds, but they and they never had, they never met, which I think is really interesting too. They yeah. never met until they became friends. I mean, they, they didn't trust each other at the beginning because they thought that the other one might actually have known more than she was letting on. Um, and then when they were finally becoming friends in the prison, it's because despite their different backgrounds, despite a language barrier, you know, they were having to communicate in broken English, which wasn't a strong suit of either of theirs. And they were having to communicate that way, but they were bound by this experience that they had had and they are bound forever. So despite those, the backgrounds, I think that that's, and despite um, language barrier, I think it's one of actually the parts that's really heartwarming about the story is that they were able to come together and trust each other in a way that they trust no one else because they went through the same horrific experience. Mm -hmm. So when, at, at what point, I mean, you 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 mentioned the that the you know Doug the journalist knew that they had been duped, but when at what point was it at the trial or beforehand that you started to finding out the details of of the the con, you know, the 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 way that they were lured in. I mean, there, there isn't like a like a, a singular moment. It was definitely a slow burn in starting to realize that they might be innocent, and I think that's because most of that, you know, their families were saying they were innocent from the beginning, but of course a family is going to say their family members innocent. Most of that of our eyes being open happened by getting access to the lawyers. And that definitely did not happen on day one, you know, day one, maybe my first trip, I was able to interview both lawyers, but they weren't letting me into their legal offices or into their meetings or definitely weren't dumping their files over to us. And so the more the more we we showed we were dedicated that to that i mean we were there all the time i was going to malaysia probably like once a month once once every couple months for this process so the more we were sort of embedded and outside their doors in the morning when they were coming to work i think the more they started to trust us as as is kind of natural in in our industry like the the more the more time you spend um the more the more people allow you in uh 
And so I think they were starting to recognize because the trial was looking so bad as it, as it continued for their clients that they had an opportunity here. Like, I really feel like the lawyers felt like they had nothing to hide. Um, and I don't think they hid anything from me. I mean, there were, there were things that they showed me that, you know, were, would, would even be questionable through some lens and the lawyers were willing to just hand it all over um, and say, get this story out there because it's not coming out in the courtroom. So once we saw all of that and we poured over all of the text messages, all of the flight paths, all of the CCTV, and literally everything corroborated both women's stories and nothing, not one shred of evidence, and I'm talking about the prosecution's evidence too that they brought into the courtroom, not one shred of evidence showed that they, were, that they knew they were doing something nefarious or that they knew that these were even North Korean that they were working with. Um, so it was definitely a slow burn, but by the end, we were, we were pretty certain they were innocent. I always like to say though, uh, I can never say that unequivocally. And we've actually had a few people watch this film and say, they clearly knew it was poison. And you know, I'm kind of like, oh, wow, you gleaned that from our film that they clearly were assassins, but I will never unequivocally say that they are innocent, but they would have to be that total, image that we were talking about at the beginning, like the most incredible black widow assassins who have spent decades hiding their connection to the North Korean regime, all to lead up to this moment and almost take the fall for the North Korean regime. Um, and we didn't see a shred of evidence that showed that. When did you make this? I, I, I loved seeing the text messages shown visually on the screen, Jessica, when, how, how did that come about, about actually showing us um, that visually? I think uh, being able to have access to that correspondence really opened our eyes in a way uh, because it was raw. It was just a big notebook of text messages that we were handed over. It was unedited. It was all of the communication and it really showed what was going on. So once we saw that, we knew that we needed the audience to see that. Um, so we, we read through everything um, and then we started, you know, just working with the graphics artist to put it on screen. But one of the things that was so important to us too is that none of this came out in the trial. So no one actually was going to see this unless we put it forward, unless we showed this evidence that to us was some of the most compelling evidence to support their argument. Because we had that and I'll add the social media, which I think was a really interesting twist too, is because their desire for fame and, and a new life via mm. social media is what ensnared them in this, but it's also what helped them. It also helps at least, it could have helped in the trial, but again, never came forward. It comes through it forward in the film. It showed what they were saying and that showed what they were doing. They were documenting everything. They were cutting to a North Korean operative who was telling them to turn off the camera, you know, and, and showing their travels as they were being, um, flown around Asia to, to, to practice, you know, a prank. Um, and so we wanted all of that to be shown as well, because all of it was really just evidence that was supporting what they were presenting as, as their own experience. Um, what did you make? Because, as I, you know, I've seen it twice now, and, this, and I've always been puzzled by, by is it Duan that looks at the camera as she walks yeah. by? What, what did you guys make of, of that? I, I make that that's a coincidence. I mean, there's cameras everywhere. Oh, we, okay. We, we, we know that now because we've spent so much time in the airport and we were able to get access to all the CCTV footage. So we had thousands of hours from all of these different cameras. So, you know, I, I don't know. That's, that's one of the reasons people have that Black Widow interpretation. But my sort of interpretation is it's a total... Uh, coincidence it's a random glance that happened to go by the camera yeah I sort of I I interpreted that you know you know they were used to doing the candid camera and that they, they saw that she saw the camera and she thought it was part of it maybe um, yeah 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 it's it's the it's the one thing as I said that earlier that you know the two times I've seen it I've, it's always I thought you guys at some point down the documentary you're going to clear that up but mm -hmm. but it's always it's, mm -hmm. it's mysterious um mm -hmm. now you you talked about the lawyers and and 
them opening up uh, to you and giving you the evidence, et cetera. How did they come about representing the two? They, 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 they seem so committed to the two of them. Were they hired by, by the government? Who, who hired them? Yeah, they were, they're both, or their teams, both of the lead lawyers and their teams are really, really amazing defense attorneys. For the case of Siti, the firm that she was working with, Gui's firm, um, always represents Indonesian nationals who are um, faced with a potential death penalty charge, which um, is more than just for murder. There's various other charges in Malaysia that would result in a death penalty. So automatically when she was charged, and faced with uh, murder would be an automatic death penalty. So it, it automatically went to Gui's firm. And then Hisham, who was the attorney for Duan, was hired by the Vietnam Bar Association, so by essentially her government. And neither of these women would have been able to afford such really, really great attorneys. And so they were both fortunate to have people who were so dedicated. And I'm glad that that comes across because not only were they dedicated, they were very brave. They were willing to say things in a courtroom that, that no one else was willing to say. They were willing to say things in those press conferences that many people were afraid to say. And they were willing to point the finger and to to stand up for their clients in a situation that is considered by many to be quite dangerous. And, and did you guys ever figure figure out how did North Korea come up with the scheme? <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the million dollar question, right? <laughs> that's like the big why. Uh, no, I don't think we'll ever be able to answer that. Kim Jong-un did not give us an interview for this film. So. <laughs> I think we'd have to do a deep dive uh, into a psychological deep dive into the psyche of Kim Jong-un. Most, most people presume that it's one of two things or a combination thereof. I mean, one, his brother was questioning his legitimacy so much um, and embarrassing him that perhaps this was a very uh, over the top way to uh, humiliate his brother, to assassinate him in the most humiliating manner you know, on camera, part of a reality show. Um, and then the other one, which I think is more likely is the fear factor that would come uh, with an assassination like this, to do it on international soil, all over camera in such a big international airport. That part worked in sending a shiver down the spine of any of his rivals worldwide, including foreign governments that barely even gave him a slap on the wrist for this. Um, you know, Kim Jong-un did get away with this. North Korea did get away with this. So the thought is it was such a spectacle for the fear factor or for the chilling effect to, to tell his enemies that he could get you at any time. And the fact is that worked in consolidating his power. You know, this, the foreign governments mm -hmm. didn't, didn't punish him in any way. And in fact, you know, you see in the end of our film, those foreign government leaders are meeting with him by the end. So there was... There was no uh, there was no punishment in the end for for uh, for Kim Jong Un and, and certainly no justice for his brother. Mm -hmm. It's just such a it, I mean it's chilling the fact that the the time that they spend coming up with this plan and putting it into place you know all the rehearsal all the previous you know uh, uh, education of the two ladies in order to to do this right. it's it's yeah. in, have they ever has have they ever done anything like this or similar in other murders do you know i mean the the normal methodology that we hear about is that it's normally much quieter you know he, kim jong un is uh i was going to say credited but accused i guess of having assassinated his uncle as well prior to kim jong nam and that was like a no one even really knows what happened there um, he was assassinated and the word got out about that, but uh, they don't know how. So this was a very different methodology and ensnaring not only these two women, but three different governments, you know, by having a, a Kur on Malaysian soil, an Indonesian woman and a Vietnamese woman, it was a spectacle, but it was also just a political, geopolitical nightmare for all of those countries to deal with. And he made them all basically let him get away with it. Mm -hmm. You know, tell us about filming back at their homes and um, you know and going to Vietnam and and after they were released. Yeah, I mean we spent a lot of time with both of their families. I think we made 
three trips to Indonesia and two or three uh, to Vietnam. And, you know, I think these families were really overwhelmed at the beginning. Um, you know, there's, there's footage of, you know, all these press trucks around both of their houses in the, in the days or weeks after the assassination. But we weren't, we, didn't, we weren't there then, you know, we didn't begin this until the trial was beginning. And so we were coming in months late in some ways, but so everything had calmed down for them, I think kind of in a scary way where they really had no clue what was gonna happen to their daughters. You know, there's, there were so many factors here. Like, I mean, one is language alone that Duan didn't even speak the language of her trial. So her family didn't either. They didn't speak the language that her lawyers even spoke. So they couldn't communicate with them. And they didn't even, like her dad doesn't even have a cell phone. So whenever we were there, we were often filling him in on what was happening in his daughter's trial. Um, and Sitsi's family was a little bit different. You know, her mom is in the film. Her mom was, was very intent on following the trial, very vocal that her daughter, uh, daughter was innocent, um, but they were kind of like the lawyers. I think at the beginning, they were, they were wondering who we were and why we were interested. And then the more we, the more we stuck around or the more we stayed in those villages uh, or whatever hotel was nearby and would again come back in the morning, um, you know, or take them to dinner um, and tell them about ourselves or our goals with this film, they were much more open with us, um, you know, and by the, by the end, I got to return to both of their villages and see both of their families get to see their daughters or sisters in person. And so that was incredibly special. You know, it was one thing for me to get to meet these women, but it was another thing to like get to watch City's mom hug her uh, when the odds mm. were so unlikely that would ever happen again. And, and have they seen the film, Brian? The families and 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 City and and the one, not yet. We wanted to bring them to Sundance, um, and that was the plan all along. And then we couldn't uh, we couldn't figure it out with City's Indonesia wouldn't let her travel out of the country. Understandably, I will say, like both these women are so protected by their governments now, um, which is which is a good thing, I think. So, uh, but yeah, we're we're. They're, they're a part of this conversation. We're hoping to get like a little reunion video with them because they, uh, they don't even, they don't get to see each other obviously and they don't, um, they still text each other but we're trying to get kind of like a reunion with the two of them uh, during the film's release. When we couldn't do Sundance, we thought, oh, well, we'll just figure this out. We have a few months, we'll do another festival. And then we just, COVID happened and we were never able to get them to travel. Yeah, um, Jessica, what a, actually, a moment to me that is really heartbreaking is hearing um, Dewan talk about the, 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 the way she sees the world now, that she used to see everything pink and, and, and now things have shifted. That is truly heartbreaking to hear from this young uh, gal. How did you feel about that? I agree. That breaks my heart. And the end too, when Siti talks about the sky and ever will she ever see it so vast? And the answer is no, she's going to see it differently forever. And Duan's going to see the world differently forever because of what they experience. I mean, they're both, their lives are changed forever. I cannot imagine what it feels like to have gone through what they did at not only the incident itself, but you know, years in prison, fearing for your life, and, and now the aftermath of that. So both of them see the world very differently, are very different, and are eager in many ways to have as much of a normal life as they can, try to get back to, to what they knew before as much as possible. Um, but I think the reality is it will always look different to both of them. Um, uh, uh, go ahead, Brian. I was just gonna say, you know, I met Duan, you know, she was, the, she was the last one released. I met her on the plane home because her lawyers tipped us off which flight they were gonna be on. So I flew with them back to Vietnam, which is how we got that footage of the press conference, you know, where Duan's still saying she wants to be an actress and she looks like a movie star. And it has this very uh, sort of like bizarro feeling to it where, you know, a lot of people were so angry saying like, she's not, Mm -hmm. She's not uh, sorry, she learned nothing. Um, and then Dewan disappeared. Her government took her in and you know she was like in a safe house and no one could reach her. 
and so I didn't make contact with Dewan until a couple months later. I can't, a couple months probably, maybe a, maybe a few weeks. Uh, and her lawyers were able to connect me with her. I flew over to Vietnam to finally meet her. But Dewan, both of these women were very different than what I was expecting. Were very different than the image or the personality that I had created in my head of who they were. With Duan specifically, she was so suspicious of us being there. Understandably, she had been tricked by people telling her they were gonna make her famous and suddenly she had an American film crew saying like, no, 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 trust us, we're making a real film about you. So when I met her, first of all, when I got to Vietnam, she didn't respond for days, um, even though she knew we were there. And so we thought, well, she's just not gonna wanna say hello. When I finally met her, it was, I thought I was meeting her in the hotel lobby, went down there, she wasn't there. Then I got a text saying, come to this taxi outside, I'm in the back, don't say my name, just get in the taxi and don't say a word. So we drove in a taxi. I mean, I was scared because <laughs> part of me was, mm -hmm. you know, this. I, I believed her by that point, but suddenly I was in the back of a taxi with someone who had just been convicted of an assassination and we're driving a taxi to I don't know where outside of Hanoi. Um, and we finally get out. She took me to some area of Hanoi and we get out and she started telling me like, I didn't, thank you for not saying anything in the taxi. I don't want anyone to know who I am. She had a mask on, which is normal now, but wasn't at the time. She had a, a wig on. Um, and so this was a woman who was like desperately seeking fame in the lead up to this. And then she and I became friends and we spent a week together and it was very fun, but all of it was this, um, I can't even call it paranoia because it's legitimate. This idea that people were gonna know who she was, that she was that woman um, and all she wanted was anonymity. So like the rule was I never said her name in public. We never talked about the story in public. That all happened behind closed doors. And that I thought was heartbreaking because that was a woman who wanted the opposite of anonymity for a decade. And suddenly her spirit, that for sort of, attention-seeking, fame-seeking spirit was totally broken and she didn't want anyone to know who she was. And she's, she's still like that. So I'm hoping she'll participate in the release in the US, but I know she would never uh, in Vietnam or in that part of the world because she wants that chapter closed and for people to not know who she is. And one last question, guys. Um, you know, the film is an incredible political intrigue and in, in, by that, 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 what we're talking about just now, the theme of the exploitation of women, of uh, the the sex trade, et cetera, um, it's so poignant as, as a theme in the documentary. Was that something that you guys thought it was gonna be part of it from the beginning? Yeah, definitely. I mean, as we learned more about the women's experience um, and also recognizing certainly that in that to that extent, their experiences are not singular. Um, we met with uh, some migrant care workers and organizations um, to talk about the experience of various migrants um, in the region. And again, it's not just limited to the region. It's again, relatable outside. Um, and I think that we wanted people to see the life that each of them had experienced, particularly, of course, Siti. I mean, seeing that sweatshop, that's really where she worked. That's the place where she went to work and hearing people talk about what life was like there is like for them still there. I think it also just helps people understand why those who are or who are skeptics and say, oh, you know, they knew they just were pretending they didn't. It's like you can just see how when faced with that as your every day, um, you can see how anyone would 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 fall for it. But particularly if you're faced with that as your every day and don't really see a way out of it, and you see this one little light shining through that potentially could could take you out, of course, you're going to follow it. Wow. Well, guys, thank you so much. The film is Assassins. It's at 100% of Rotten Tomatoes, Ryan, and it's going to stay there. <laughs> um, it, it's just such a phenomenal job. I encourage everybody to spread the word and tell everybody to check out and check out the film. Um, Jessica, Ryan, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Thanks so much, Roger. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Take care.